and why I think they are so amazing and, um, and how they continue to inspire me in my research. So first of all, right off the bat, we need to settle some um, questions about my first slide that I overheard. And the questions might be, how many grasses are in this picture? How many, do, how many, how many of you think there's one wrasse? Two wrasses. Okay, three wrasses, anyone? And how many people are not voting? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and how many people think there are four wrasses in the picture? Yeah, okay, all right, that was, that was good. Um, yes, so all of these fish are in fact wrasses. Um, there's three species here. This is our, our main uh, event, Symphodus pinka, is the big, big pretty one here. We also have a cleaner wrasse, Symphodus melanocercus, and two females of another wrasse that I'm going to talk quite a bit about today, uh, Symphodus ocelotus. So this, this picture is from my field site. So um, we're going to get more information on these guys in a little bit. Um, but first, I want to tell you a tiny bit about myself. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Simon Fraser, and I study fish life history traits in general. So life history traits like offspring size and number and um, other mating habits that fish had, which we're gonna talk a lot about today. So sometimes I study them in the field in beautiful places like the Mediterranean, sometimes in a lab under a microscope because they're really tiny. These are, these are rats in front of me. And sometimes I use a lot of computer modeling, so a lot of my work is actually done over in Burnaby uh, in an office with few windows. So. Um, but I'm excited about wrasses, and that's what keeps me going through the long, rainy winter months. And today I'm going to tell you um, about three of the main things I'm most excited about in my own research. Wrasse biodiversity, wrasse behavior, and how that links to biodiversity. And finally, conservation, which is something that I have been gradually more and more um, been pulled into, which is very exciting. Okay. So the first thing that I want to go over is fish biodiversity in general. Okay, when we think about biodiversity, we're usually talking about the number of species. There are other definitions of biodiversity um, that you may have heard of, but the big one is just species number. And when we think about water and marine species and aquatic species, um, there's a really big contrast between the amount of water and habitat available for marine species and, and freshwater in rivers and lakes, right? So the oceans are about 10,000 times bigger, they have 10,000 times more water than the freshwater habitat on Earth. Okay, so if we were to put all the freshwater rivers and lakes in the world and compare it to all the water in the oceans, the difference would be absolutely gigantic, which is not that surprising, right? But when we look at the number of species in each of these types of aquatic environments, we see something really surprising. Okay, first of all, there are a lot of fish species. There's around 18,000 marine fish, 600 of which are wrasses, which I'm excited about. There's around 13,000 in this tiny little volume of freshwater on the planet. Is that, is that surprising? Yeah. yeah, why do you think that could be? Right, okay, so yeah, you guys are good. The ocean is connected and rivers and streams are subdivided. So if we think about it, all right, yes, and so the percentages are, are almost equal when we think about it. Now, one other thing I wanted to point out is that, okay, 41% are in rivers and lakes, 58% in the oceans. When you add those two numbers together, do you get 100%? No, you don't. You get 99%. What do you think is going on with the other 1% of fish? What, what are they? Well, again, this is a little bit of a trick question, but uh, the other 1% of fishes are in both marine and freshwater habitats. Okay, so they're sort of both. Can anyone think of a fish that might be in that category? Yes, in the front. Salmon, great, yes. Local example on everyone's mind. Can you think of another one? Yeah, salmon are the, are the first one. Yes. Thank sharks. You. Sharks. Okay, they're actually indeed. Do you know what kind of sharks? Lemon. 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 Not 
not so much. So bull sharks are one of the shark species that's occasionally found in freshwater. And there are a few species of freshwater ray that are technically Latin friends, but sort of like sharks. Eels, great one. Yes, eels are fascinating creatures. They also have a uh, migration in between freshwater and saltwater. And those are the big ones that I was thinking of. There are a few others like sturgeon. Um, <coughs> sorry. They, they are cute. <laughs> so basically, that's our global picture of fish biodiversity. But let's talk a little bit more about why uh, rivers and lakes lead to more species than a giant connected body of water. Just so that we're, I'm sure that all of you understand why that's the case. It's because these natural, natural geographic boundaries that you might get when a ri river diverges provide a barrier to gene flow. So that means that here our, our red population of fish might be exchanging genes with our, our orange population of fish upstream, but they're probably not going to be exchanging genes with these yellow populations directly. And <coughs> a barrier to gene flow like this is pretty much the easiest way to get a speciation event. Does anyone have any more questions about that right now? Okay. So, just to summarize, speciation is more common with geographic barriers. So why do we have so many wrasses? Why do you think we have 600 wrasse species, given that they're all in the ocean and it's all connected? Okay, well this is a really hard question because in fact we don't actually know the answer. This is sort of an ongoing area of research in evolutionary biology. But I think it's really exciting and I have some ideas. And I think the reason for why is because wrasses have evolved really diverse lifestyles, so they're capable of evolving a lot of different habits and life histories, unlike something like a salmon, which are much less diverse. And part of that is related to their specialized feeding morphology. So there's some really special traits that wrasses have for feeding that we're gonna talk about. And also because they have really elaborate social behavior, so they have some special mating system attributes that um, I'll give you some examples of. And I think both of these are possibly really important in explaining why RAS diversity is so great. Okay, so let's talk again a little bit about RAS specialization. Okay, again here I'm showing you a picture of two RASs. I have a big RAS here, this is the dragon RAS, or um, what I like to call the rock mover RAS. Some people call it that because it um, it feeds by picking up rocks and overturning them on the seabed to see what's underneath and then gobbling it up. And then we have our little cleaner wrasses here. So this fish is, um, is in a really characteristic pose for a fish that's being cleaned. So he's sort of hanging in the water and he's got his mouth open because he's gulping water and pushing it out through his gills right here. So this, this would be what, if I were to just take a really big breath and make myself as big as possible, I would basically be doing what this fish is doing right now. So if you happen to be snorkeling and you see a fish kind of hanging in the water, like that fish on the first slide was, start looking around for a cleaner, because it's probably the case that you're at a cleaning station. Okay, but this guy is one of my favorite wrasses, not because of this, the fact that he's a client of a cleaning wrasse but because of um, the way that the juveniles of this species look. Okay, so one of the things about wrasses are that the juveniles, or the first initial phases of its life, it looks really different from the terminal phase. So this is a terminal um, end phase here. So the juveniles, in this case, let's see. I'm gonna show you on my next slide, I'm gonna show you what the juvenile looks like. A little video, I just love these guys. So and next I'm going to show you another fish that has a really amazing adaptation. And that is the sling jaw wrasse here. Have it, has anyone here heard of sling jaw wrasse before now? Okay, these guys are predators and they have a really special mouth adaptation. So when they're feeding, they actually throw their jaw forward, creating a vacuum that scoops up their prey. And that's what this looks like, okay? 
it is lightning fast. But here's the prey over here. And uh, <laughs> this is just so cool. I can't believe this photographer captured this. But um, it was probably in an aquarium, I can tell you that. Um, these guys are, are famous because um, they've been studied. This behavioral adaptation is so unusual and so effective, it's been studied in great detail by a lab at UC Davis. And again, I'm going to try to show you some video. Rass's jaws have shown an amazing amount of diversity um, that has enabled them to specialize in a lot of different food types. So that's a theme in RAS diversification that I want you to keep in mind. OK. Those are just a couple of my favorite examples. But in general, I really love wrasses because they're some of the most charismatic species that you'll see if you go snorkeling on a coral reef. First of all, ha has everyone here seen a coral reef? Has anyone? OK, most of you have. OK, so when you jumped in the water, um, you know, probably noticed there were some color, really colorful fish around. The probability that one of those fish was a wrasse is incredibly high. They are some of the most um, unafraid, visible fishes on a coral reef. And there's so many of them, and they're everywhere in the world. So, so the likelihood that you've encountered at least one and, and maybe more wrasses if you've been in the tropics is, is pretty high. Okay. Especially when you think about the fact that parrot fishes are wrasses. So if you've ever seen a parrot fish, you saw a wrasse. And I really like parrot fishes because they, again, have some really specialized feeding adaptations. And that's their teeth, so their little beak that gives them their name. So when you go to a coral reef or, or anywhere that you see a lot of fish swimming around, there's a pretty easy way to tell if the fish you're looking at is a wrasse. Does anyone know what that is? No, well, this is a hard question, again. OK, so I'm now I'm going to show you some parrotfish video. And I'm going to show you the parrotfish is going to be eating. But um, there's also something very specific about the way that wrasses swim that I want you to pay attention to. OK, so if you happen to see a fish, even if you just go to the aquarium, look in the tank, start looking at the way the different fishes swim. And look for the ones that are that they're almost there, once you get an eye for it, you can just automatically pick a wrasse out because of these pectoral fins. It's unlike anything else. Some fish um, swim with their pectoral fins, but not in sync. So like, kind of more just like, they just do not have the same elegance and grace, let me tell you. OK. So one of the things that I mentioned to you was that wrasses tend to have an initial phase and a terminal phase of coloration. And when I showed you the sling jaw wrasse, I first showed you a rainbow colored guy, and then I showed you some video of a gray one. So does anyone know why that video was of a gray one? Where did that gray sling jaw wrasse come from? Yes? Black sea. OK, not so much. The Black Sea uh, is full of colorful fish, in fact. OK, so the gray one was the female, or the initial phase. Um, so for the parrotfish that I just showed you, there is an initial phase. And it looks like this. This is the female. So female wrasses are almost always um, smaller and more cryptically colored than the males. So the reason for that is that wrasses have a really unusual mating um, system where they, um, it's very common for them to be born as one sex and change into another one. And it almost always is the case that they're born as females and then the largest fish in the group get to be a male. So this, they're pretty famous actually in the world of of fish, fish researchers for this sex change behavior. And the most famous example, the, the one that's been studied in the most detail, is called the bluehead wrasse, and it's native to the Caribbean. So when you have this kind of sex change, they call it sequential hermaphrodism. And <clears throat> it's actually really interesting, because all kinds of social behaviors go into determining who gets to be the male 
in a given group. And a lot of it has to do with relative size at a certain developmental stage. However, some species have uh, two male types. The blue head is one of these, where some individuals are born as males and they never become big and blue like the terminal phase male here. So you actually have two pathways to being a male. You can be born as female, and then if you get big enough, become a male, or you can just be a male from birth. And if you're one of these secondary male types, you often have a completely different mating tactic um, than the, the big male type, which is more of a courting male. Um, you're often a sneaker. And so that's something that's really important in the system that I study, and that I'm gonna tell you more about. Um, but I just want to give you an example of how fish negotiate who gets to be the male. And a lot of it is based on their relative size. So here I'm showing you a picture of fish that are showing another really characteristic fish behavior. If you ever see fish in a tank doing this from now on, you're going to know what they're doing. All fish, uh, not all fish, but most fish do this at some point. And uh, we call it mouth fighting, even though they're not really fighting. They're comparing. So, so fish mouths are proportional to their body size, and um, they make a really useful measuring stick if you don't know how big you are compared to the other person. So uh, a lot of times you'll see fish just sort of doing this, deciding if they're going to fight. You know, if, if uh, there's a big size difference, maybe it's not worth it. So here what we have actually is a different situation where we have a fish that's transitioned to the male phase, and we have a female who's, who's pretty much the same size and maybe even a little bit bigger. So you can see that this guy maybe didn't make the right choice. It's possible this fish should have stayed the female and let this one become the dominant male. So let me tell you, it's hard sometimes to be a fish. Okay, so when I said that most wrasses are sequential hermaphrodites, actually, <coughs> Not all of them are. And the fish that I study is a, is a conventional two sexes, males and females from birth, um, all the time. Okay, and we already talked about the fact that the females of my species are, are, look like these ones here, and the males look like this. So they're pretty small, and they have really elaborate parental care behavior. Okay, so unlike the bluehead wrasse, which spawn their eggs in the water column, my guys spawn their eggs on the bottom, or the vent posts, and they um, defend a little nesting territory. Um, and the males are the ones that do all of the parental care and defend their nest. Okay, so think about that for a second. We have a situation where males do 100% of their parental care, and if they don't, the eggs will, will absolutely die. Some will eat them, or they will get fungus and not develop and hatch. There are no birds and mammals that have this lifestyle. There are birds and mammals that have biparental care, where dads help, but it's usually optional. On the other hand, there's over 8,000 fish species where dads do most or all of the parental <coughs> care. There are some with maternal only care, um, and some that don't need care at all, of course. But this is actually a really interesting question. Why is it, why is it that females do all the care in some types of animals, and males do all the, type, the care in other types? Does anyone have any ideas? It's true, okay, I like that idea. Some, some species, the females are stronger, so they raise the kids. That's a good idea, but the truth is that we don't actually know. This is, again, an ongoing question. I'm afraid not, this is, uh, this is intensely debated. <laughs> so, in the case of my fish, Symphodus ocelotus, the male puts a great deal of effort into building a nest and he courts females to come spawn in the nest. After the females spawn for a while, he then spends about a week defending that nest from egg predators and cleaning and fanning the eggs so that they don't get fungus. After that, the eggs hatch and the babies swim um, and, 
and carry out their life cycle on their own. So it's about a week of intense parental care. And the parents among you here will sympathize because parental care for this fish is really hard. In fact, only about 10% of males that build a nest will actually be successful in hatching out babies. So that means that 90% of males who spend a lot of time, it takes three or four days of intense work to build a nest, 90% are not going to get any babies out of it. So one of the things that uh, the people I work with are really interested in are what determines nest success. Who, who gets to be one of these 10% of successful males? Well, it turns out that we don't know, but a lot seems to be related to earlier success. And this is because once a female has invested some eggs in a nest, other females will pile on and also lay their eggs in the same nest. There's no real limit to the number of eggs that a male can take care of because the eggs are tiny. And so what that means is that if a male is really successful, he's really invested and he's gonna stay and not abandon. So by copying each other, females can sort of collaborate and make sure that they all choose the same male and he's gonna be invested enough to devote an entire week, during which time he's not gonna be able to eat much, um, to caring for those eggs. So this is a case where it actually pays to put all eggs in the same basket. Okay. However, there's a whole other aspect to the story that's going on here. And this is because in evolution, when you have strong reproductive skew or, or, or reproductive success is really biased, it means that a lot of males are losing. They're not getting any fitness. They're not getting successful nests. And that creates conditions that are really <coughs> conducive to the evolution of alternative male mating tactics. <coughs> so, in other words, sneaky males. So when a few males get most of the eggs, small males who are never gonna be big enough to, to build a good nest start sneaking. And this is sort of a best of the bad job scenario where maybe they're not gonna get as much fitness, but they will get some fitness. <coughs> In our system though, it's, it's complicated enough that we have another male tactic that has evolved, which is a satellite male tactic. So in this case, nesting males are so fed up with sneaker males that come in and steal fertilizations from them during spawning, but provide none of the care and pay none <coughs> of the costs. They actually recruit helpers, cooperative males that help them <coughs> defend their nests against the sneakers. So we have a really sort of unusual situation arising where non-related males cooperate together to defend a nest against sneakers. And the reason that a lot of people say, oh, cooperation only evolves when there's uh, some shared genes, it's like kin selection involved, well, that isn't true if both parties are benefiting. So of course the satellite male has to benefit some way from helping out this nesting male. And it turns out that he also <coughs> sneaks. So he also manages to get some fitness. And in fact, we've been able to show that, yeah, you get a lot of fitness if you're a nesting male, but you get a lot of fitness as well if you're a satellite male, because you have a lot of opportunities to sneak. Whereas a sneaker just drives by every once in a while and is, not, and is in competition with all the other sneakers. Okay, so this is a fairly complicated story that I've been telling you. So now I'm gonna show you some video and uh, you guys can tell me what you think. Before I get to the video, I'm gonna introduce each of these types of fish that we're gonna see. We've got our nesting male here. This is the nest. I don't know if you can tell, it's like a little cup of algae. You'll see it in the video a little better. This is the satellite. So he looks pretty different from the nesting male. He's got a pretty um, visible black bar. And then this is the sneaker male over here. He's, he's speeding away from the nest. There's a female here, she's kind of, this is a nest. She's confused. She's like, what's going on? Why aren't we spawning? So, all right. I'm gonna move along to talk about the last part of my research, which is on um, how, 
about the conservation of rests. So here's, uh, does anyone know what this fish is? Yes? The hump head, this is actually not the bump head parrotfish. This is the hump head wrasse, but that was a great guess, yeah. Did, did anyone else have hump head wrasse on the tip of their tongue? Okay, has anyone heard of the Napoleon wrasse or maybe the Maori wrasse? That's, these are all this guy. He, this is one of the most iconic wrasses in the Indo-Pacific. It's distributed all the way from uh, Papua New Guinea all the way um, past Indonesia, all along the coast of Australia. And it's actually really important in uh, native culture and uh, it's also one of the first marine species to be officially recognized as endangered by the International Convention uh, for, let's see, CITES, the Convention of International Trade in Endangered Species. It is the first one to be listed um, that's actually fished. Uh, seahorses were, were listed around the same time. So, yeah, these guys are disappearing really fast. Partly because, uh, you know, they're really big. They grew, grow to over two meters. But also, they're wrasses, so they, they do change sex. <coughs> There's a, they're so big, actually, that they're not targeted in their full adult stage because they're too big to make a nice dinner plate um, entree. They're, they're actually fished most heavily at their, at their plate size stage, which is when they're still juveniles. But given the fact that they change sex, anytime you're fishing a population like that, and you're reducing the average lifespan of individuals, you're selecting for um, males to change from female to male at a smaller size. Okay, so this is another example from California sheephead. This is from a male from a population that's pretty close to Los Angeles. It's about 26 miles away. So fishing pressure is pretty heavy here. And you can see that the male's pretty tiny. On the other hand, if you go offshore for about 10 minutes, sorry, not 10 minutes, uh, 10, well, you go offshore longer, maybe a few days. I'm not sure how long it takes to get there on the boat. Um, you can get to populations that are um, fished less intensely, and you find much, much bigger males. So this is a problem for species like the humphead wrasse, because as soon as you're selecting for smaller males, you're losing females to males, you know? Suddenly you have much fewer females to produce eggs and kind of um, promote resilience of your population and allow it to replace itself. Okay, the second thing is that not only are rasses themselves, uh, do they suffer when you fish them, but they play really important roles in ecosystems. So they, um, parrotfishes do all of this scraping of algae and coral. They grind up the coral and they pass it through their system as sand. So actually most of the really nice sand that you find in places like the Caribbean has passed through a parrotfish at some point. And all of that, all of those beaches are, are due to parrotfish activity. But I read somewhere that a large male parrotfish can produce about 90 kilos of sand per year, which is pretty cool. Okay, so yeah, one of the most important things that you can do to protect coral reefs is to stop fishing parrotfishes. So I just wanted to leave you with the idea that wrasses are really cool, but they're also necessary for healthy oceans. And now you might be thinking, that's great, but I live in Canada. What can I do to help wrasses? Most wrasses are in the tropics, which is a fair point. But on the other hand, Canada is one of the few countries, okay, yeah, so s I'm gonna argue that you need to start small and think big when you're thinking about helping out wrasses and our oceans. And specifically, uh, you could, for example, write to your MP and tell them you want Canada to um, support CITES trade regulation. So Canada is one of the few countries that haven't agreed. Hong Kong has, the United States has, European nations have. And um, <clears throat> for complicated reasons, Canada has not. So that's one thing. Another thing is 
Um, looking for sustainable seafood when you buy it and asking for it in restaurants. And the third thing is to keep coming to events like this. Keep learning and keep talking to others. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention.